lead placement. In this module, we will be looking at a 3-lead, 5-lead, and a 12-lead system, and their paperwork that you would get with them. The 3-lead system. Notice how I've got the heart positioned in the chest here, and this is to highlight the information we've covered in our anatomy and physiology section. This is influencing why we put the leads where we do. We have our white lead which goes to the right upper chest and it sits just under the clavicle and in the soft tissue space. The black lead which sits in the left upper chest, again, just under the clavicle in the soft tissue space. And then the red lead which sits at the lower part of the ribs or just under the ribs. Now we have a saying to help us remember our placement and that is white to the right and smoke over fire. Now you'll notice this triangle. This is Eindhoven's triangle. If we go back to that history lesson we had on ECGs, he was able to identify that this three lead placement will actually give us many views of the heart. Particularly, we're going to be looking at lead two and we'll come back to this paperwork and the leads that we're gonna see in a few minutes. Now for doing a five lead system, you'll notice that our white our black and our red are still in the same positions under the clavicle in the soft tissue space. So this is right arm, left arm, left leg. And now we're gonna add two additional views. So we're gonna add the chest lead, which will give us what we call the V1, and it's going to be looking particularly at the right ventricle and the right, the interior right septum and then the right leg limb, which is green. And so the saying for here is snow over grass. And I'm not gonna tell you what brown stands for, but snow over grass, smoke over fire, and I guess poop goes in the middle. That's what we're gonna talk about right there. I did say it. Okay. Now, if we're looking at a 12 lead, everything changes on the chest. These are our cardiac leads or our chest leads. V1, member in the last one, I'm gonna come back a slide. This brown lead in the center, which is sitting in that fourth intercostal space on the right side of the sternum, is looking at the right ventricle and the right septum. That's known as V1. So now here we have our V1. It's in that fourth intercostal space, and it is on the right side of the sternum. It's going to be looking at the right side of the heart. V2 also looks at the right ventricle and septum. So these two are pairs, but this one is gonna sit on the left side of the sternum. V3 and V4, so we're now moving down. If you position V4 at the midclavicular line in the fifth intercostal space, that's where you put V4, and then V3 is gonna go between V2 and V4. So we often place V1, V2, fourth intercostals, V4 at the fifth intercostal midclavicular, plant V3 in between. Now V3 and V4 are gonna be focusing on the apex of the heart and the anterior surface of the left ventricle. V6 then goes in that mid axillary line at the fifth, sixth intercostal space and then V5 goes in between V4 and V6. V5 and V6 are looking at the left ventricle and looking in towards the septum. Now in addition to this, so these are our six cardiac leads, you would then put four additional leads on your patient. You would have a right arm and a left arm, and they can go anywhere on the arm between shoulder to wrist, as long as they are at the same position on both arms. And then you would put one on the right leg and the left leg, and those would also go at the same level, so whether it's the calf or, usually it's about mid-calf, we put them, but anywhere between the knee and the ankle. When we print out a picture of our three lead or our five lead, we're gonna get this picture right here. You'll notice it says lead two here. You can select a different lead on your machine, but lead two again, we use that because it has an overall picture of the heart's electrical conduction, and it creates the highest voltage for all of our waveforms as they leave this baseline. Anything that goes up or down is considered a waveform, and so lead two gives us the highest voltage. As you'll notice here, it does, in the three lead system, one is a negative, one is a positive, and one is a ground. It can happen in any direction. So it could be negative, positive, and then the red would be the ground, and we would be looking at electricity moving from the right side to the left side. 
or it could be that the black is negative, the red is positive, and the white is a ground, and we would be looking at movement of energy from the left arm down towards the left leg. So all just different views and have unique traits to them. But essentially the one we want to focus on is the white lead is the negative, the red lead is the, red lead is the positive, and our ground is the black. So this gives us our lead to picture. And you can see, if you remember the heart is sitting in here, electricity is going from the SA node to the AV node to the Purkinje fibers. It's going in the same direction as our lead to. So this would be a six second strip. It has 30 large boxes as we call them. So if you were to count out all these dark lines, you would see that there's 30 of them and that would equal six seconds. Coming back to that triangle, this is the influence of the science of the 1900s from Willem Eindhoven. When I had mentioned that the white could be negative, and the black is positive and the red acts as a ground, this gives us the picture of lead one. So from right to left is lead one. Again, we have white to red. This is our lead two, negative to positive, and the black is the ground. When white becomes the ground and we have negative black to positive red, this is what we look at for lead three. So in leads one, two, and three, this is requiring that one, oops, one electrode is the negative, one electrode is the positive, and the third one is, or is the ground. When it comes to these augmented leads, so Eintopen actually also gave us an additional, additional information to look at. We call these the augmented vectors, and that's because they are using the heart as the negative pull, and then they're looking towards each one of those other three leads as the positive. So when the heart is the pole looking towards the red, we get our augmented vector foot lead. Heart is the negative, my apologies, looking towards the positive left arm where the black lead is. This is our augmented vector left. And then of course the last one is our augmented vector right. Now again, you don't have to know that for this course, but this does show up in our 12 lead tracing. So this is typically what we get printed out in the hospital. This is called our 12 lead. You can see now here's lead one, lead two, lead three. And they just have a really short snapshot. You see this little hash mark here? That's the end of our snapshot. And then we get into augmented vector right, augmented vector left, and augmented vector foot. And again, just a quick little snapshot to see how the heart looks from those perspectives. Highlighting them here, these are the six limb leads. Now the six cardiac leads that we talked about, vector one, two, three, four, five, and six, are shown here in the upper left, or upper right of the page. And I just wanna show you this here quickly because this also is something that people will use when looking at a 12 lead to identify where the STEMI or the ST elevated myocardial infarction is happening. So where these blue boxes are, leads two, three, and the augmented vector foot, feet, they're looking at the inferior part of the heart. So if there are changes here, excuse me, if there are changes here, then they would classify it as an inferior ST elevated myocardial infarction. That will make more sense as we get into the different parameters of an ECG. But just note that when we're looking at our lead two, which we're going to be focusing on here at the very bottom, the changes should be showing up here as well but the doctors will come back to identify the particular location where the injury is. So lead two will tell me that there's something wrong with the heart and these particular leads, three augmented vector foot and two, if there are changes consistent here, as we see in lead two, that will tell me that the actual area of insult is the inferior MI or the inferior heart. If it happens to be in this red area, so we're looking at vectors one, two, three, and four of those cardiac leads. So they were looking at, in particular, they were looking at, let me just come back down here. One, two, three, four. If there are changes here that are consistent with what I see on lead two, that is telling me that we have problems with the right ventricle, right septum, or the inferior ventricle. So that would be called an anterior STEMI. Now the green sections, V5 and V6, as we said, is looking at the left side of the heart, the left ventricle and the left septum. 
and leads one and AVL also do that, that would be considered a lateral STEMI. So if there are changes in leads one, AVL, V5, V6 that are consistent with what we see in lead two, then that's how they identified as a lateral STEMI. So we are focusing on lead two because it gives us the overall picture and what your physicians are looking at in the rest of these leads help to identify the particular location of injury, which will give us information about the blood flow in the heart and the particular signs and symptoms we might see. Now here's what I wanna just highlight before we move on to looking at waveforms and intervals. And that is that computers can be wrong as well. ECG machines provide us with an analysis of each waveform, and this is known as the computer intelligence. But they are not always correct, which is why we need to know what we are looking for and complete our own evaluation of the waveforms. The most common interpretation that is likely to be incorrect is atrial fibrillation. There are a lot of rhythm patterns such as sinus arrhythmias, atrial ventricular blocks, artifacts, even Wolff-Parkinson-White syndrome that can be misdiagnosed by the computer intelligence as atrial fibrillation. So as you can imagine, it is important that we identify the correct rhythm because let me tell you about this story. 60-year-old female, she comes in, she's been falling and she just says that she's really not feeling well and she's kind of lightheaded. So we order an ECG. This is one of those things we want to see. Is the heart the reason that this patient is falling? Could it be related to cardiac output? The ECG is done and it diagnoses atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation usually is treated with anticoagulants. So patient is started on anticoagulants and 24 hours later develops blood in the stool. We call that melina. The anticoagulation therapy was held and upon review, they looked a little closer at this ECG. They identified that it was not atrial fibrillation, but rather there was a regular irregular pattern that was consistent with sinus arrhythmia. We will be looking at that shortly. But just to highlight some of those features here, you can see that these red arrows are pointing to a positive, um, upright, half rounded, image on the ECG and this is known as our P wave. So the fact that there are P waves visible would negate uh, and that they are round and upright would negate an atrial fibrillation diagnosis. In addition, what they noticed is that this blue mark, so between this R wave and this R wave, it's the same as the R waves over here. And then the red line here between these two QRS complexes is the same measurement as here. So this is a pattern that's consistent with changes that happen when we inhale and exhale. So we're gonna look at sinus arrhythmia shortly, as I mentioned, but this would not be treated with anticoagulants. And that is the key thing here I want you to pick up on is that because the computer may give a diagnosis, I do not want you to focus on that diagnosis. In fact, I want you to consider that wrong until you prove it right. So look at that as a challenge. Hmm. It says it's atrial fib, but I don't believe it until I do my own analysis. And you're gonna come down and break it all down. So that's what we're gonna look at next, is what are the normal waveforms and the intervals that I need to be looking for to determine if my ECG is normal or abnormal.